Uh, Michelle? Ah, there we go. Morning, everyone. We just sort in a few technical uh, uh, things out for the talk. Um, special welcome to everyone who's online. We know that there's a lot of viewers online. We welcome you. And special welcome to those that also came. Some of them came from quite a far away. I know this person here came from Bontierville for today's talk. And uh, Country Living Essentials, I thought I'd just give you an intro why we covering these countries living essentials. Um, our first talk was on uh, soil. The second talk we had was on food preservation, on canning. And uh, we were very blessed by both speakers. And the purpose of uh, these country living essentials is to equip people to be able to basically live off the system. Um, the motivation for this comes from a text in uh, Revelation chapter 13, which I'd like to read, Revelation 13, verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so we know we're nearing this time in Earth's history, and we see the forces coming in, and we see what we call a siege warfare uh, looming on the horizon. We all went through COVID, and it's out of these that we've got together experts in different fields to make the move to the country to facilitate it for everybody, to, to cause, to bring a unity, a support structure, uh, expertise together and so we've we're going to have many talks on different topics with specialists in those areas um, as we have today with Henny who's um, come here yeah. and all these people that are involved here yeah, are dedicated to helping and they have freely offered their time freely offered their expertise because freely we have received freely we give and uh, I would just like to ask the Michelle and Brom, just come forward here for a second, please. Um, yeah, yeah, we, you know, some of us just talk, the others do the work. So let's introduce you to the people who really do the hard work, Michelle and Brom, for especially for all the online viewers. Um, all the advertising, all the communication um, comes via them. They give of their time. And let me tell you what, these two are a very dedicated couple. I know that Silverleaf would not be the church it is without their support. And so, yeah, we just want to say thank you. So if you're communicating, you'll be communicating with M Michelle. And Brahm is the technical expert. So together they make a great team. So, yeah, thank you very much. So today is our third talk. Um, the next talk will be on the, in May. Uh, Michelle, what was that date in May? Uh, the talk will be on purchasing a property. And Madeleine Barnard, who is a conveyancy attorney, will be presenting the talk. And she will be giving, it's on the 19th of May, she will be giving the legal aspect of purchasing a property and et cetera. And then we'll also have Cecilia, Cecilia McGuinness, who is a chartered accountant and is also an expert on finance. So she's going to be telling you, talking to us on the options you have of the entities you can purchase a property in. And so that's going to be a very fascinating talk. So, and please remember, if you come, you have the privilege of asking and meeting these people. Um, online, you can... As the seminar goes on, you've got any questions, please send them online. There's an option to send them online, um, and then we will attempt to ask, answer them. After the, uh, Henny has presented his talk, we will have um, two installers up on front here to join him, Kumi and Dean. They both have solar companies. I'll let, you, I'll let them introduce themselves uh, when we do the question and answers time. 
And uh, so if you have any questions, you can pose to them, also get to know them. They're willing to help you in that field. Um, yeah, today we have Henny Muller. He's a uh, high-level industrial engineer and has a lot of expertise in alternative energy. He's going to give you some more background to that. And so without any further ado, um, Pastor Donovan, if you would like to come and open for a word of prayer with us, we will immediately go into our talk. Thank you very much. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to go through the session together. Lord, thank you that we can, can learn and empower ourselves practically in this way. Pray for your blessing. And thank you for all those who are joining in person and online. We pray that this would be helpful to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Henny. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, and thank you for Silverleaf for the opportunity. Unfortunately, the solar business, everybody is an expert. I don't know if you realize that, but it's an industry that sprung up. It's, uh, it's uh, going through its infancy in terms of legislation, regulation, and all of those type of things. So the challenge with solar specifically, and we'll talk a little bit about wind just now, is the fact that there's so much noise out there. You know, everybody tells you something, and everybody is an expert, and you get horror stories, and then some people do good jobs. Kumi, I can see you laughing. So uh, <clears throat> maybe a little bit of background on myself. So I see a lot of familiar faces. So I was saying, listen, I'm just going to go alt tap and do a sermon because there's so many familiar faces. But okay, so today we talk about solar. So my background, I studied uh, mechanical engineering, aeronautical engineering, went into the paper industry. In 2012, I got involved in the energy sector. So 2012, South Africa's trouble seems to have started, but that was when the wind farms started. So that's where... I got into this energy business. Um, we were very involved in almost all the wind farms in terms of the installation component. So not the civil works, electrical works, but the installation. So that's the physical technicians. We receive the turbine components, move them to site. We get the big cranes, we build the turbines, and we commission them. So that's the, the history. I did that up until, I think it was about 2020, and then... Um, started a business specifically going into development of solar, wind farms, uh, energy assets. Let's call it like energy assets. So that's a little bit of my background. Um, our business doesn't focus hugely on residential. The market is way too crowded, and uh, it requires too much detail on that level. So we're more in the commercial industrial side. So for factories, big farming operations, and then we also do developments of solar and wind farms. So ArcelorMittal and Van Abel, the old ISCOR, with uh, a company called Placeti Nuclear, we did development of the 200 meg solar, specifically for that steel mill. <coughs> and then also a 100 meg wind farm that we're busy developing in Saldana, on Saldana Steel's property. So that's a little bit of my background. So I've got a bit of experience and exposure in terms of... Thanks. Thanks. So I've got a bit of exposure in terms of the development side, the construction side, and then commercial and industrial solar. Okay. The challenging part with solar, and now when we talk about solar, we're actually talking, especially in the country living context, you're talking energy. Yeah? So energy you can get in different ways, and we'll talk a little bit about it. I'll go in a little bit on the technical side. There's similarities between wind, solar, hydro, um, biomass, et cetera, et cetera. All of them can generate energy. You can convert it in usable forms. We're just going to talk a little bit about solar and wind. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, in the country living context, depending on where you find yourself, one or the other might be suitable for you. Let's just see if this clicker works. <coughs> clicker doesn't work. It's fine. So maybe... Oh, I need to show it to that side. Let's have a look. Oh, there you are. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Brom. So maybe in the bigger context, let's just get the backdrop <coughs> or the lay of the land first before we're going into solar, because uh, 10 years ago, nobody was, nobody were really interested in solar. It was the oaks that lived off-grid in funny places that were looking into solar, and today, everybody's looking at solar. So the question is, what happened? <coughs> well, ESCOM happened. <coughs> Sorry. So ESCOM, for most of you that don't know, 
was actually the number one utility in the world in 20, uh, 2001. I'm not sure if you're familiar. So, so the people in ESCOM were really, really qualified. And even still, if you go to ESCOM, some of the best guys in the world. Problem is, there's been political interventions and problems in ESCOM. But from a technical perspective, ESCOM is an excellent, excellent company with excellent skill sets. And it's so unfortunate that that, let's call it that, absolute gem in South Africa has been battered to where, it's, where, it, where it is currently. Because South Africa were the first in terms of transporting energy the way we did. So a lot of the ESCOM guys sits in, sits in Western Australia, so the expertise are well sought after. But just from a solar perspective, what does a grid do? So South Africa, there you'll see a picture of the grid. Let's zoom, zoom in a little bit. Um, mainly our big uh, generation sits up north, typically your coal-fired stations. That's our big resource in South Africa, sits up north. And then we have some pipe, uh, pump storage schemes in the grid. And then you've got some peaking stations. I'm not sure, have I zoomed in there? Let's just do that. Yeah, so we've got some pump storage schemes, and then we've got peaking stations. Now, the peaking stations, if you're really in trouble, because they're super expensive to run. But typically, a grid, you have central generation. You distribute the energy through transmission, which is usually very high voltage, and then you bring it down. Then it goes into distribution, and then it ends up at your home. So that's typically the way the grid works. I'll tell you now why it's important. <clears throat> so the one thing that's that's important when you look at a grid is many times people will tell you, you know, we need to go for renewable energy, we need to go off grid, you know, all these type of things. So uh, the grid unfortunately needs to work on base load. So base load is heavy energy on the grid to keep the grid stable. <clears throat> you can't have intermittent supply. Typically you can't run a grid only on wind. You can't run a grid only on solar. You can't run it on only biomass because that's intermittent. What you need is base load. So you need the grid. You need those big, big, heavy equipment, Madupi, Kusili, Kuberg, to generate the base load, to stabilize the grid. And then you can put these intermittent resources on top of it. Okay, so the wind farms and the solar farms, they do work, but they'll never save our grid. Most people are really surprised to see that or to know that those resources, like a solar farm or a wind farm, they actually need the power of the grid to run. So if the grid is off, they're off as well. So you can't do black start with those resources. You need those resources to run off a base load grid. So for South Africa, <clears throat> we're going to run on coal fire and, and nuclear for a very long time. Um, but renewables does have its place. Okay. So if you typically only would run, that's my attempt just to show you, if you take the base load a, 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 away, and you've got intermittent resources, wind, wind farms, solar farms, won't work. The grid will fail. So it's a little bit of a, a chicken and an egg situation in that picture. It's, sorry, I'm, I'm having my own slideshow here, so I'm not sure. Okay, my PC and the screen doesn't work together, but it's fine. I'll manage that. So you almost have a, a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation. This picture is quite comical. You've got your... EV, and then you've got a generator to quickly charge them because uh, the batteries run flat. So the grid is almost in the same situation. You need these big assets to keep the grid alive. But solar energy, wind energy, hydro does have its place. It's very unique. If you're in the sticks, like some of the big lodges, uh, farms, typically in the Uppington area, it's invaluable. It's actually amazing. Um, that you can have those panels and you've got full functionality of your facility. It's running, it's running irrigation, it's running pumps. So there's a place for that. <clears throat> it's being pushed into the utility scale. It's fine, it works, but that's typically where it works at its best. Maybe for those uh, who can't remember school, maybe a little bit of a school lesson. So energy, I'm not going to go through the definition of energy, but energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed to, from, from one form to another. So solar energy is not creating energy, it's converting energy. So if you look at typically, sorry, I'm doing it over and over again. There's the definition. It cannot be created or destroyed, but it can only be transformed from one form to another. So 
typically, if you look at a coal fire station, it could be nuclear, it could be anything, you typically put in energy, and I've just called it you capture the energy, then you convert it through a process. It could be steam turbines, and then you generate DC or AC electricity, and then you distribute it, okay? Solar is exactly the same. People tend to think that solar is this magical thing. Solar literally just takes the sun's energy, the photons, and it creates electricity from that, and then you can convert it into DC or AC, and then you distribute it and you can use it. Only challenge is the sun doesn't shine 24 seven, so it's an intermittent supply. If you typically look at wind, wind is almost exactly the same. So there's a certain segment on all these technologies that's very similar. It's mostly the front end where you capture the energy that's different, whether it's solar, hydro, etc. So wind, you basically take the movement of the air, you turn blades, you get horizontal turbines like the ones on the wind farms, or you get vertical turbines. In essence, they capture the energy, then you convert the energy into DC or AC, and then you distribute it. Um, hydro, exactly the same. Obviously, hydro, usually the scale is much bigger, but uh, the water flow, you convert it via Pelton wheel or whatever, water turbine, and then uh, convert to AC or DC, and then you use it. So all these systems are very similar in that sense. Usually, these systems are big systems. <clears throat> but typically, the scale we're talking now is typically where you start moving to what they call a microgrid. Um, as I said, a normal grid, typically a spine type of scenario, central generation, and then you transmit, and then you distribute to the house. Microgrids are a little bit different. So that's where, as the one gentleman said, when you start managing microgrids, you need a man on a horse. So solar systems are relatively simple, and then there's a certain scale when you start moving into microgrids. It becomes very complex. Um, in the previous example, you've got big, big power stations, big inertia, big equipment running, so it forces that sine wave and you've got your electricity. And uh, what you do in your little house is really not gonna impact the big generation at Kusili and Madupi and one of those things. But when you're looking at microgrids, <clears throat> and suddenly the grid is only, and it's a hub and spoke type of concept, where the grid is one input to your local energy system. You could have wind, you could have solar, you could have biomass, you've got diesel. So it's a, it's a central system, a microgrid, so it's a mini ESCOM, and uh, that poses quite a bit of challenges in, uh, in managing that microgrid. <clears throat> because if you think about a grid at your home, and even the grid in uh, like ESCOM, typically ESCOM, if you go to the control room, 24 seven people are sitting there. It's a super, super sensitive thing. It's big. It's, but it's very sensitive. It's almost like a big bowl, flat bowl with water in it. And on one side, you've got water running in from the big kusilis and madupis. And then you've got hundreds of little pipes pulling out of it, extracting water. But they need to balance this. If they don't get the balance right, you can have a blackout. Now, blackouts happened. They've had it in America. They've had it in a few places. So the grid is a very sensitive thing. But it's a big thing. When you do a microgrid, you've got a little bowl of energy in your home and your farm, and you need to balance it. And if you have the wrong pumps starting at the wrong times, et cetera, et cetera, you can have flicker, you can have a lot of problems on your internal grid. And this starts to become a very big issue, and it becomes very technical when you start running continuous factories and processes where they can't afford to trip of having issues. Microgrids are fairly challenging. It's relatively new in the industry. So the concept of running microgrids was never the way the energy system was designed. It was designed with big central generation, stable electricity. None of us should worry about electricity. We should be going on to our normal business. And now the industry is forced to look at microgrids. So that's, that's quite challenging. So a solar panel, basically photons, specifically looking at solar panels now, <clears throat> or solar energy, hits the panel, and it's got a photovoltaic effect, and it pushes electrons, and it generates electricity. So you can almost see a solar panel sitting in the sun, almost like a battery. When you draw a picture, you know, the old science classes with a long and a short stripe presenting a battery. <coughs> That's typically what a solar panel is. It generates a certain voltage and a certain current. So it's a battery <coughs> when the sun is shining, and then it diminishes as the sunlight goes smaller. So Typical components, you've got your solar panels, you've got your inverters, sometimes you have the batteries, and then you've got your switch gear, etc. that you typically would need. In terms of solar systems, 
So now I, know, I, I, I don't want to lose you. This is, uh, if you remember anything of the, of the presentation, I think this is, this is the important part. So, so typically a solar system, you'll have solar panels, and uh, this is a grid tight. So in essence, you've got two types of solar systems, the broad spectrum. You've got grid tight or PV solar systems, and then you've got hybrids. So the big difference is your PV or grid tight needs the grid to be on. That's typically the technology you'll use on a big solar farm. Um, initially, when solar really took off in South Africa, it was mainly grid tied systems because the grid was stable. So what will happen is the grid tied inverter can't live on its own, so it's not grid forming, it can't form a grid. So it sits on the grid and it's a policeman. So it will look at the solar panels and it will always give the solar panels preference. Ah, oh, thanks Paul. It will always give the solar panels first preference, okay? But the grid needs to be on. If the grid is off, your solar system is off. So, typically where you would find systems like that other than big solar farms is typically big irrigation schemes running on solar. So those solar systems need the grid to be on, but it will have the grid or the solar give it first preference to run the load. So that's the cheapest way of solar, and really that's a no-brainer. The, the econ economics behind it is simple. It just makes a lot of sense. Typically a rand per kilowatt hour for those systems runs at one rand 20, one rand 30 for the bigger system. So it's much cheaper than the grid. So that's a grid tight system. It's off when the grid is off, but it's very cheap. And it makes a lot of sense if the grid is stable. Then you get a hybrid system. So basically a hybrid system <coughs> is a grid tight system, like we just discussed, but it's got a battery to keep it alive in simple terms. So the hybrid system will stay alive. So it will take the solar, it will run your loads, and ESCOM, or the grid, is just another input. If ESCOM falls away, no sweat, it just runs off the battery, you might not even notice it. ESCOM comes back on, chup, it just runs, no problem. So that's the two main categories, grid tight, and these places where that makes sense, and then your hybrid systems where you've got the batteries. Now batteries adds a lot of cost to a system. The batteries is expensive, and the batteries doesn't have an infinite life, it only has so many cycles. Okay, so that's the two major systems. But when you look at residential and commercial and industrial, and I don't want to give you a lecture, I, I don't, the intention is not that you go and design your own system when I'm done with the talk, it's really just to give you, to give you context. So within the hybrid system, so that's where you have battery backup, you basically have two ways to design a system. Smaller systems, residential, you'll typically design like this. It's really simple. You've got the solar panels on the roof. The DC cables will come off. It's direct current. It will go into an inverter. It will charge the batteries. It will carry the house, and it will also have an ESCOM input. So that's a really simple way of doing it. And even commercial, industrial, they systems like a TESS, uh, those type of systems that can run a normal Hybrid, this is DC coupled. DC coupled, it means the solar panels goes into the inverter, direct current, and it charges the batteries. The batteries is also direct current. Similar to your car battery, 12 volts. These are 54 volt type of systems. But that is DC coupled. So typically where you will use it in a very simple installation where the orientation of the panels, preferably north, that's your best orientation. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's DC cables, it's not far from the panels, it will go into the inverter, close to the DB box, and that's like 99% of the residential installations would be those installations. And those inverters are, it's relatively affordable, we'll talk about them just now. So that's the one way to do it. When you have more complex installations, typically commercial, industrial, maybe some residential as well, we've got different um, orientations, the panels are far away from the DB where you want to put the, the switch gear, etc. You actually go and borrow, remember the grid tide inverter? That's off when the grid is off. So what the guys do is they put a grid tide inverter to the panels. There's advantages of using a grid tide inverter. The efficiencies are very high. You can connect quite a lot of panel sets to most of the grid tide inverters. So what we do is we create a grid tide system because it's the most efficient. But what we do is the grid tide inverter immediately converts the DC to AC. And the uh, internal grid, so typically this building, there's an internal grid where the plugs are, you know, the AC, everywhere where you plug in, that's the AC grid internally. It will immediately push the energy into the internal grid. 
So immediately into your, uh, let's call it the microgrid of the home. And that will push ESCOM back. You can even export if you're allowed to, but the energy will go into the internal grid. Then what we do is we have a battery inverter. It's almost like you plug the battery inverter in, in the 220. Remember the solar power came in DC, it converted it to AC, so the power is now sitting in our normal electrical reticulation system, so we don't need to have expensive DC wiring running long distances. So it's sitting there where we can access the energy. You, effectively plug in a battery charger with the batteries, and it's bi-directional, so it can push energy back into the system. So it's a pool of energy. The, the, the grid tide inverter throws energy DC to AC into the pool. We extract from the pool and we charge the batteries, and if ESCOM is off or the solar is off, we'll start pushing energy back into the pool through the battery inverter. Does it make sense? So that's what they called AC-coupled systems. So most of our big commercial installations are AC coupled. There's, there's, there's quite a few technical advantages of doing that. <clears throat> but for most of you, one will look at the, the previous one, which is the normal hybrid system. Okay, so this is typically, and we're talking in the country living context, so it really depends on your setup. You've got big stores, warehouses. So, so the, the, the guy who's gonna do the design for you, he needs to look at those aspects and see what's the best option for you in terms of efficiency, making sure you get the most out of your investment. So that's AC coupled. So you get grid tight, you get hybrid. Within hybrid, you get DC coupled, relatively simple, you get AC coupled. Everybody happy with that? I think that's as complex as it gets. So solar is not that complex. Okay. So that's the typical design methodologies. There's some un other methodologies as well. So um, leaving the home set up and maybe looking at irrigation, typically there you can look at grid tight, as we mentioned. So grid tight where you can assist the, the, the consumption of energy by using solar for pumping, or you can have what they call VSDs, which can run without the grid. And it can run you, it's typically like your little solar pumps. I'm not sure if you're familiar. So on the farms and the sticks, they've got these little panels if you're driving the Karoo, and uh, the solar will go through a VSD, and it will run the pump, and if the sun goes down, it will go slower. So there's solutions for that. I haven't gone into that too much. So irrigation is, is something, so, so, something different. Uh, it's also a little bit specialized, and, and, uh, but there's a lot of solutions for irrigation, typically in the country living type of scenario. <clears throat> so you've got your solar system. Um, in the solar system, again, I've just taken it down to, to residential level, um, not commercial, industrial, but typically the components would be on the left. That's a Fronius. That's typically a uh, grid tight or PV inverter. To the left, we like to couple them with the Victrons because they talk to each other really nicely. In the middle is a battery inverter charger or a hybrid inverter. That's typically a Victron. They're usually the better quality in the market. We can talk about that just now. And there's a, um, a, a battery set. There's, there's, there's quite a few battery manufacturers. Quite a few of the batteries are, you know, Ketel manufactures the cells. They come out of much of a muchness, uh, out of the same factories, but that's Freedom One manufactured in South Africa. Uh, so that's the main components. The rest of the components is typically what your electrician would do. It's wiring, DB boards, your um, combiner boxes. So that's normal, let's call it ele electrical infrastructure. But this is the main components of the solar system. At the bottom, your solar panels. <coughs> you can typically have them on the roof. That's ideal. It's the cheapest, the simplest. But if your roofs don't face properly and you've got space, you might want to go for ground mount where you mount them specifically for at the right angles, right directions, get the maximum out of the solar panels. And the little red block is typically an example where you have <coughs> the mounting structures on the different roofs, whether it's tiles, IBR. There's a, there's a lot of mounting systems for, um, for them. I mean, it's, it's quite an established industry. There's, there's solutions almost for everything. Okay, so that is solar. I don't know if there's any, any quick questions on that. Was it clear, the different systems? Um, yes. Sorry, can we
but uh, again, I'm, I, I did not quite follow you on that. What is the advantages for me as a mm. homeowner? Uh, why should I consider the AC uh, coupled versus the DC inverter? coupled? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so ninety-nine percent of the time, you're most probably going to go DC coupled. It's 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 simple. Uh, it works. Uh, the challenge with DC coupled is, or not the challenge, is that you physically need to connect the panels to the hybrid inverter wherever you put the hybrid inverter. So if you've got a house where they're relatively close, so it's a relatively small building and the DC cables can run, then uh, you can connect it to the, to the hybrid inverter, then it's a relatively simple installation. Okay, so that's that side. The AC coupled one is where you've got larger buildings, complex things are happening far apart. You don't want to run hundreds and hundreds of meters of DC cabling, et cetera. Then you typically will have the panels and you'll convert to AC from DC as quick as possible, as close as the panels as possible. And then the, you use the existing wiring that's in the house, the AC, the 220 or the 400 volt internal wiring. You'll distribute the energy through that wiring. So it's when you've got big factories um, or buildings where you need to move energy and you don't want to, the cabling is very expensive. So a big part of solar is, 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 is actually cabling. You know, on the bigger systems, it becomes a very big cost. So typically that would be the one reason. Um, and if you have complex sets of panels facing in different directions, etc., etc., you'll start looking at AC coupling. So AC coupling is usually more the commercial and industrial. Big buildings, we are going to use a lot of cabling if you look at the other one. Um, there's, a, there's a component they call, or inverter, they call a TES. A TES is typically a commercial industrial version of that. You can also AC couple that as well. But I think for, for the normal, I mean 99%, this is going to be sufficient. Because it's a residential or it's a house, things are relatively close to each other. When you've got big factories like Ford, where they did the 10 or 14 megawatt solar parking lots, you know, then, then you go AC coupled. You get stuff into AC, get it into the AC reticulation network, and you pick it up where you need it. So it's really, really nice. I'll, I'll show you. You know, there was actually quite a nice. Uh, the internet is not that good. I actually wanted to show you Cathedral Peak uh, running AC coupled. It's running hydro, grid, diesel, and solar, and batteries. So that's quite a nice system. So there you can actually see that live. So I'll see if I can log in and and uh, connect to that site. But yeah, it's usually your bigger sites where you really want to dump the energy in the AC the reticulation network and uh, not run a lot of cables. Does it answer the question? Thank you. Uh, if I may, just one uh, quick one. Um, let's say you have a, a five kilowatt uh, uh, inverter. Can you upgrade that same inverter to a, a nine or, or a higher level? No, so inverters are boxes with the electronics. You can parallel them. So depending on the technology, most of them you can parallel. So you can put two of the same, then you've got 10 or three. Some of them you can put three and you can change into three phase as well. So most of them you can parallel. And that's typically where Victron is ideal because it's, it's, a, it's dad's toys, it's Lego blocks. You can play with them and move them and change them and adapt. So that's what makes that nice. But usually most of the brands, you can parallel them. But you can't change the inverter's capacity. You can't just uh, unplug a, a component and upscale it. Not, to that, a not that I'm aware. Yeah. No, no, no. So you just get, but it's relatively easy to parallel them. Um, but you need to look at the other things as well. So electrician needs to be present to make sure your cable sizes and all of those things are adapted for the extra energy you want to push through the system. Could you just explain to us the, the problem with DC and AC cabling. What is the problem there? Why, why do you want to? Well, cabling is expensive. DC cabling is expensive. And, and even AC cabling. So, so the, the econ economics would say, listen, if the building's already got its AC reticulation network, so the cabling is already paid for, then dump the energy as quick as possible into that energy pool where you don't need to run cables. If you need to run DC cables, uh, cabling is expensive. I mean, that's the short answer. There's other advantages for AC coupling, which is a little bit more technical. You can integrate with more components. So typically, like Cathedral Peak, you can dump hydro, diesel, 
because you're working on the AC reticulation network, and then we've got an energy management system that talks to each one of those generating assets, and we can pull back and, and, uh, and, and make them do what we want to do, but we, we manage the pool of energy in the middle. So that's the one advantage. So, so your, 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 these ones are usually a little bit more limited. They're very specific. You know, you put it in, it's got an AC input, and that's pretty much, pretty much it. Uh, but it's good enough, and you get them in big systems as well, but it's good enough for 99% of the solutions. Again, this is more commercial industrial when you want to start doing funny stuff. <coughs> Happy with that? <coughs> Sorry. Can we move over to, to wind? I'll stick with solar still, because really what we're talking about is not just solar. Solar is one component of energy generation. Basically, especially in the context of country living, you want to look at everything. I mean, we had a discussion just before um, the session where if you, if, you, if you want to do a little small hydro, it's relatively simple, you know? Car alternator, Pelton wheels, put it on little inverter, push it into your other inverter via the AC side. So there's, there's ways and means. So that's why I'm giving a little bit of a broader spectrum because it really depends where, did you, where do you find yourself. You know, if you're in the city, if you're here, pretty much solar is going to be the answer. Wind, you won't be allowed to put up other than it chops up the birds and someone's going to chase you is the fact that um, people don't like to look at these things. So pretty much you're confined with solar. But if you're out in the country, you can look at multiple multiple energy inputs. So that's typically your components. Again, remember we said capture, convert, and then you distribute. And that's the same for most energy systems. So when you look at wind, it's not much different to solar, although it's completely different. It's very similar. You've got the wind turbine, and all the wind turbine does, it captures the energy of the wind, and it turns it into rotational uh, energy, and then you can run a generator, which will generate DC or AC. So what it makes a wind turbine slightly different to solar, when the wind blows, it blows. So mechanically, this thing turns. And uh, it's difficult to stop them, uh, especially if there's high winds. So with wind turbines, you'll typically have voltage regulators to chop the voltage. So uh, the amount of energy, you're limiting it. Otherwise, it can run away. So it's got mechanical um, brake systems, the smaller ones as well, uh, but also electrical. You can brake them electrically as well. And then you put them through the same system. So you get inverters that's made for wind turbines. Interesting, though, SunSync, which is a solar inverter, can actually take a wind input um, without any big issues. It's got the software already on it. So if you want to do wind and solar, and you don't want to go super expensive like Victron, which has also now got wind modules, uh, but it becomes very expensive, a SunSync, typically. You can just plug in, in one of the, they call it, let's call it the energy inputs, they call it the MPPT. You can put solar in, and the other one you can put in wind. There's one or two calculations just to limit it. You can't have it too big, so it's usually 30% of the inverter size. So for 12 kilowatt, you'll put 3 kilowatts of wind, and the balance you put in solar. The nice thing about solar and wind is the fact they complement each other very nicely. So if it's usually overcast, solar is low, especially in the Western Cape, then the wind blows. So they complement each other really nicely. So if you're off-grid, you really want to have a combination of the two if you've got wind. But in essence, that's the, the small little wind turbines. The um, wind turbines in South Africa on the small scale is not that popular. Uh, there's a lot of Chinese, but I mean, you can burn your fingers. We'll talk about one or two brands just now. But um, this is usually, you'll see them a lot in Uppington, those places where the guys don't have ESCOM. ESCOM I don't know. They just stopped. They didn't go through Uppington. And uh, a lot of those farms run completely off-grid. And then usually they have wind, and they've got solar working, working together. OK. So if we look at brand names, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. I'm not saying this is the best, leave the others. This is typically the brands we work with. So there's other brands that's also very good. There's brands like Mega Revo, uh, INVT is also relatively good. Um, Maybe the big difference between the inverters, because it's really horses for courses. When you go to get an energy system, you need to decide, is this something I want to do for five years, so I'm going for cheapy? Because you really get what you pay for. Um, you get cheap inverters, um, capacitor-based inverters. 
um, and they will, they, they, they might last, but usually they don't. So typically five years, you're going to have to replace them. Um, it's just the nature of their design. They're simple, they're relatively cheap made, but sometimes if you just want to run light loads, lights, little things, you don't want to run heavy loads, motors, inductive loads, things like that, then they're good enough. They, they might last you long. Typically, the Victron, what makes it nice, it was developed for the marine industry, so it's, it's got that um, reliability behind it because it was developed in the marine industry in the Netherlands. So they transformer-based inverters. So they're relatively good when you run motors. So on a farm where you've got pumps and things like that, we would typically just put in a Victron um, because they're transformer-based. And then your big inverters, when you start going commercial industrial, they're almost almost all of them are transformer-based. So uh, that gives you a little bit more teeth. Victron is good. SunGrow, SunGrow is number one in the world. Um, they're very big in grid tide inverters, solar farms. Uh, we use them in our AC-coupled systems as well. Huawei is a big name. They've got very good products, very good products for commercial and industrial as well. Very big company. Solar Edge is really good. It's a little bit different technology. Um, Oh, I don't want to go into that, but that's slightly different technology. Uh, um, it's a European brand, and you can um, get very good yields when you've got different orientations of solar sets. Then typically a solar edge is something that you would look at. There's typically a SunSync inverter, super simple to install. Uh, software is really easy. It's really, and, and I would say, oh, a huge amount of the installations out there is typically the SunSync or the Dyer. They actually belong to the same company, Dyer, manufactures SunSync. I would say that's a, that's a good value for money type of thing. If you want to put in an energy asset that's going to stick with you, then I'll go for Victron. I mean, no question about it. Um, but SunSync's good value for money. As I mentioned, you can stick a wind turbine in there. It works. It's simple, and it's relatively reliable. On the battery side of things, there's a gazillion brands um, with the most funniest names. Uh, these are typically the names that's, that's in our market. Blue Nova manufactured locally, um, Solar MD manufactured locally, Freedom One also manufactured locally. When I'm saying manufactured locally, it's actually assembled locally. They don't build, they only assemble. The cells are made by Ketel. Um, uh, and, and they literally assemble, and then they put the battery management system on top of it. But the technology inside is very similar. Typically on batteries, what's important is a battery is not an asset that's going to last forever. It's got limited cycles. So you get 4,000 cycles, you get 6,000, and now you get 8,000. I'm not even sure. I think you get 10,000 cycles now as well. And then typically you don't throw the battery away after 6,000 cycles. It diminishes the capacity. So typically it would go down to 60% of its capacity. So there's still usable capacity. But you need to know that when you cycle the battery, it's actually costing you money. So people will put in the solar and then they'll go wild and just use it. It's actually costing you money because that asset's life diminishes. So on the big commercial industrial systems we put in, the big batteries, I mean, you pay millions for those batteries. Those batteries... Under current load shedding, level two, you'll cycle them twice a day. So you can think it, it makes a huge difference. So that 8,000 cycles, uh, if you cycle them twice a day, that's 4,000, let's call it 4,000 days. So that's even eight, nine years. And if the load shedding gets worse, that, that number comes down. And it's a big capital expense, especially on the big, the, the, the big installations. So the battery does cost you money. So once you've put in your solar system and you're going wild with the power, just keep in mind, the cycling of the battery does cost you money. And Pylon Tech is also a very good battery. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just putting out there the, the brands that we're comfortable working with. There's, there's, there's many, many others as well. And they're popping up every day. There's new companies, new companies as well. Um, yeah, and then on the wind turbines, I don't want to go into all the brands because it's a really small portion of the market. The little wind turbines are very expensive. Um, uh, it, it, uh, we'll look at the costs and the, and the numbers Oops, just now. This is owned by EverReady. They're in Port Elizabeth. They've been manufacturing these turbines for a long time. They're really reliable. They're tough. Uh, but they're expensive. I mean, the physical turbine, the E400, 
Um, I mean, that turbine, to install that turbine with all its gears, it's easily 350,000 rand. So the turbines are really expensive. You really have them when you don't have anything else. So typically in the South African context, where we've got a lot of solar, very few things are going to beat solar. Uh, the answer is, I don't know what the question is, put panels on. That's, that's usually just the answer. It's just the simplest way to, to have energy, unless you're in a spot where you're limited in some shape or form. Typically in the northern hemisphere, Scotland, um, those farms up north, uh, where you're very desolate, um, Sweden as well, you'll have a lot of these smaller turbines running because the solar radiation is just not strong enough. Um, but yeah, we would typically work with Kestrel, simple, uh, very robust little turbines, but yeah, very, uh, very expensive. Let's just quickly look at the numbers. I just want to move my slides. For some reason, the computer and that doesn't run with each other. This is very high-level numbers. I don't know. How many of you already have solar? I assume you've got problems. That's why you're here. <laughs> so... So this is high-level numbers. Eh? So it really depends what brand, and it also depends on your site. But I mean, typically, to give you a feel for the investment, that's really, and it's, it's high-level numbers. So typically, a five kilowatt. So out there, one of my friends, he's installed more than 700 Victron systems. Um, that's his business. That's all he does. Um, 90, let's say 85% of his installations is typically a five kilowatt Victron MultiPlus with 10 kilowatt hour batteries. That's almost like the McDonald's of what's out there. Everybody usually takes that. So I've just taken the five kilowatt as an example. So if you'd put in a five kilowatt grid tight, so that's when ESCOM's running stable, you don't want batteries because you've got the grid, you just want to save money, you're going to typically pay about 100,000, typically. Um, that will give you about 7,000 kilowatt hours a year. I've reduced it because under load shedding too, you're going to lose 14% of its production because 14% of the time it's going to be off. Um, I see city of Cape Town is, is getting expensive with its uh, tariffs. They're running about three rand, three rand fifty uh, per kilowatt hour, which is which is quite expensive. But if I work on three rand fifty, um, this system will generate energy to the value of about 25,000 rand per year. So it's costing you 100. So if you have interest in all of those things calculated, in about five and a half years, you'll pay the asset back. So, and now you need to balance it because if you start looking at bigger systems, five and a half years seems okay, but then seven years, we usually calculate every seven years you need to replace the inverter. So um, in our models, seven years, we replace the inverter. But it's about five and a half years. It's the cheapest way of using solar energy. Then. The solar hybrid, I've made those two in blocks because those are backup systems. So that's systems where you've got batteries because you don't want load shedding, okay? So you need to remind that when you look at the economics behind it, there's a, uh, a component of I want electricity, so I'm going to pay for it, okay? So typically a 5 kilowatt, 10 kilowatt hour, this is not Victron, this is typically your mainstream systems. You're going to pay about 100 and say, between 150 to 200,000, depending on what brand you're looking at. Um, that will give you about 8,250 kilowatt hours in the Somerset West Basin. Um, paying that back, it's going to cost you about 233,000. When you've paid back the finance, let's say you go and loan the money from the bank at three and a half rand per, per kilowatt hour, that's about 28,000 rands worth of energy it will produce for you, roughly. So you're going to pay it back in about seven or eight years. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of a feel if you only want to make the decision on paybacks. And moving into wind, it's just getting more and more difficult. So wind grid tight, same calculations, it's about 260,000. It's going to generate about 28,000 rands worth of ele uh, electricity or energy for you per, per year, and it's going to take you about 12 years to pay it back. Now a wind turbine can last 15 to 20 years, especially the Kestrel ones, if you look after them properly. And then the hybrid side, it's also about 12 years plus. So you can see it, it becomes very expensive. If you take interest in all of those things in, that little three and a half kilowatt can cost you almost half a million, 425,000. So it's the, the wind side is, ex is expensive. But this gives you a little bit of a feel. So typically the McDonald's, the, the, the standard one that most people go for, the five and 10 kilowatt hour, you can get a payback five to seven, eight years. Um, 
depending, obviously, I haven't calculated escalation on energy costs, so you can do that some as well. We can guess 10% a year, then that eight years might come back down to five years. But that's typically the numbers. Um, does it make sense? Familiar numbers for you? What you need to consider is the inconvenience of load shedding and unexpected uh, breakdowns from ESCOM side. And then also uh, what I, I worked out mine to be uh, paid down much, much quicker, three years. Mm. Uh, and, and we don't know. ESCOM has just put it up. And uh, next year it's going up. So you didn't consider that those those no. risks in in those figures. No. So I, I I mean escalation is a little bit of a everybody says ten percent, twelve percent, but uh, so, so typically yeah. If ESCOM goes up, that number might come down even further, and it really depends what you put in. I mean you can put a cheaper nasty in, you'll pay it back very quickly, or Victron, it's going to take you much longer. But it depends what is your decision making cycle. You know I want energy, I don't want load shedding, and I don't want to put it in a second time. Then you, you, you'll have different numbers, yeah. So just a question from my side. Apart from a complete system like this, are there any other solar options that one could recommend just to save electricity, for example? You know, maybe a solar geyser or things like hmm. that that is limited at least as a starting point? Yeah. Now, that's a good question. So when you put in a solar system like that, batteries is expensive. So your kilowatt hours for backup, you want to conserve. You want to use it as sparingly as possible. So um, typically solar geysers. Now solar geysers, I'm not an expert in solar geysers. The only reason I know it's because we're sitting in the sticks uh, on the farm. Uh, they have their issues. They don't last forever, but there's another technology coming now where you've got a little inverter box with three panels, and then you use a normal electric geyser, and it becomes a solar geyser. Those seems to work relatively well. But yeah, I mean, on, in, in my case, talking about the smaller systems, I, we, don't, we don't put heavy elements like geysers and things like that on the solar system. It's unnecessary. So we've got gas. That's typically just in our case. But gas is also getting expensive, and it's sometimes the supply is also intermittent. But yeah, those heavy um, energy drawing equipment, one might typically like your oven as well. So typically, people won't put the oven necessarily onto the solar. So if the grid is off, then you don't use the oven um, because you can, you'll deplete the battery very quickly. I mean, a 7 kilowatt hour battery, or 10 kilowatt, gives you about 7 or 8 kilowatt hours if you put on the oven, which is three kilowatts, two hours and the battery is dead. Yeah. So you need to work quickly if you, if you want to do that. Is there another question? Okay. So typically, uh, this is a Victron system. Oh, sorry. Just define cycle. The? A cycle. Yeah. So a battery. Um, how they define it, and it, it depends uh, of the battery technology, but typically if it's fully charged, 100%. You can discharge it, and they usually have a cutoff of 20%. Some of the big commercial batteries you can discharge 100%, but usually about 20%, and then you charge up, that's a cycle. So you've gone through one cycle, so 80% of the battery back again. That would typically be a cycle. So if you've only done half of it, that's a half cycle. Um, so a lot of the warranties on the batteries, they also look, if you abuse the battery, so they give you nice warranties, but if the battery has been abused, they're not going to refund you, the, or, or some of the warranties fall away. So, so you need to be careful so that the guy that puts it in needs to do it properly. Otherwise, the warranty is not worth the paper that it's written on. So you need to look after the battery the way the manufacturer tells you to. No, we could. We could. It's just in the context of this, it's good, because it, uh, you know, then we might need to come back. Okay, but I'm almost done in any case, so we're going to go into the Q&A just now. So this is typically a Victron system, typically our installation would look. Those are two Quattro inverters. Um, as I said, good quality, and it's, it's built to last. And that's typically what you want if you're in the sticks, and you're really dependent on this only. But it's horses for courses. You need to make a decision whether this is good enough. 
The panels are going to last you 25 years. They've got usually a linear production guarantee on them. So the panels will last if it's properly installed. Uh, the batteries has got its cycles. The battery technology is a little bit of a much of a muchness. But the inverter is the one where you need to decide whether you're going to invest a little bit. Then you can do a little bit more with it, or it's just for lights, and that's also fine. Okay, that's the installation. Oh, that's that's Cathedral Peak. So that's that's a 700 kilowatt hour uh, a battery system with inverters. It's got uh, hydro running on it. It's got Jenny running on it. It's got grid running on it. So this is quite a nice installation. It's pretty much as complex as it gets in terms of all different energy inputs, and that you can now scale to to big megawatt installations, four or five megawatt uh, installations for factories. We we're busy now with a. Uh, or potentially busy with uh, a, a fish factory that came back to us last week, where they now want to put in 1.5 megawatt of solar and 4 megawatt hours of battery. So, but that's typically how those installations look. Uh, and those installations are almost always AC coupled, AC coupled systems. Yeah, and then just some notes from my side. Um, we subcontract installations. So I'm not an expert. Kumi, you guys need to come in because you know of all the the issues you face on site and the things that wasn't considered. But um, you know, when you look at the installer, rather get the, the guys with at least some certification, which is not a guarantee, but at least it showed you that they've gone through the effort of complying. So it's no guarantee for they've got a PV green card. We've seen horrors with some PV green card installers. But uh, it, it gives you a sense that the guy's gone through the process. A lot of financing institutions have accredited in, uh, installers. Um, there's some suppliers, like Heralds, um, which supplies lots of these equipment that also have a list of suppliers that you can reference with. But uh, the best is always word of mouth. Go and ask three or four places where it's installed and, and the things are working, and the backup is there. Because these things sometimes have nicklies, and you want to phone someone, you don't want to be without power. One important thing, people forget that, the roof structures. The solar panels are not that, um, that light, 25 kgs a panel. But eventually, if you put three, 400 panels on the roof, that's quite a load. So usually, you need to get a structural engineer, if it's a big installation, to come sign off. Or you need to strengthen the roof. But that's the important part, especially when you register with City of Cape Town or the insurance. So make sure that's in place. So if someone comes to your place, just ask them. You know, if they don't look at the roof, then there's already a, a red light. Secondly, the yield, um, the yield calculations. Uh, most of the small installers don't do that for you, but yeah, let someone do a yield calculation if it's important for you. If it's not important, but that will give you an indication of your production. Also, look at obstacle shading, all of those things. Important with solar panels. If the the the, the solar panels, uh, it will it will run according to the production of the weakest panel. So so that's why you don't want. Uh, panels that shade it, because that's going to bring your production right down, even if one panel on that string is shaded. So you don't want shading. And even throughout the day, have a look that you want as open as possible. Uh, that's where solar edge is nice. You can break it up so that it uh, buffers a little bit of that, those problems. Um, but look at obstacles. Solar, doesn't, solar panels doesn't like shading. And even if you have shading, you can damage the panels, because it limits the energy on that section. So it unbalances the system. Um, City of Cape Town, municipalities are getting with the program. City of Cape Town is actually quite far advanced in terms of you registering. They've got approved lists of inverters. Funny enough, this inverters are actually not approved by City of Cape Town. You need to do stuff, the Victron inverters. Not all of them, the MultiPlus as well, but some of the Victrons you can't. And the reason for that is, the way they generate the sine wave, they create noise. So you can get harmonics feeding back into the grid system, which can cause quite a bit of problems. Uh, that's a huge issue with the big solar farms and wind farms is harmonics. It's always a fight with ESCOM. So make sure that your inverter is on the list. I think if you're in this area or with a municipality, at least go to the municipality. If you're in a small little town like us, uh, they fall behind. <laughs> so, so at least go and talk to them so that you don't get caught off guard when they say, listen, you're not allowed to put the system on. And then there's things that can go around, the mounting structures. If the stuff is not mounted properly, you've got the storm that you have now. You're going to pick up your panels and strand, um, if you're lucky. Uh, hot spots on panels, also a problem. So, but that's on the bigger installations. So the panels can go wrong. Uh, you all heard of the Vodacom 
roof that started burning. Not sure if it was hot spots, but that's typically what could happen. And then also wiring, the DC wiring on the roof. DC wiring is like a, a welding machine. It's going to arc and it's going to arc and it's going to arc until it's, you know, there's nothing. It's not like a, 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 a AC. So, so you really want to make sure that you're wiring on top of your roof because it's going to lie there for the next 25 years that it's done properly. No exposed wires, things like that. So it's, it's simple things, but it can really cause trouble. You know, and, and you have houses burning down because of poor installations. It does happen. That's that from my side. Um, Paul? Maybe we can go into a proper Q&A and... Yeah, I think uh, Kumi and Dean, if you'd like to come forward, take a seat here, um, pick up a mic. And yeah, then we can go on with Q&A. Uh, if you could introduce yourselves. Uh, Kumi, I know you're a qualified electrician. Um, both of you have got your own company. Um, so yeah, Dean, maybe if you want to first to us um, and then Kumi just give us a little bit of a background of what you do yeah and uh, yeah go for it Dean please okay so I own a solar company the company's name is somewhat solar We've, we are based in Musenberg and we're operating for I think three years now my name is Mbulelo you can call me Kumi uh, I'm a director of a company, um, Solar Choice. Um, um, we've, we've, done, we've done quite some work in different places as well, police stations, homes. I've got some of my clients sitting here as well. Um, that's, that's, that's it from my side. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anything arising from the talk that maybe you want to broaden on something that you picked up that, that you think maybe the, the audience hasn't, uh, doesn't fully understand. I know any, thank you, that was, uh, I've got more questions now. Um, and uh, one question I have, if I may ask you, is specifically on wind, because I know when I started out, I was very interested in wind, but everyone seemed to discourage you on, on wind, and I know you mentioned that, um, the dangers of it and et cetera. Is it, so would you say it's, it's not really a good option if you've got sun? I think the, 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 the benefit versus the cost ratio is not that high. So, so wind, you'll re typically, I mean, you'll find these wind turbines, thousands of them on yachts. So that, the, uh, that makes sense because you don't have access to energy. So you've got these little Victron systems working and wind is the obvious choice. Um, but in South Africa, again, where you've got solar, which is so cheap in terms of, I mean, solar panel prices have come down so much. It's just, it's just the easier route. There's, there's places where you want to augment. As I said, wind and solar works well together, but then you need to holistically look at your, your cost of system. Um, so it's not that wind doesn't work, it's just expensive. How would it help you with your battery life? Like, because obviously mm. once the sun goes down, your, your wind turbine could help with those cycles that you were mentioning. Yes, yes, yes. No, it could. Again, wind is intermittent, so, so you can't depend solely on it. So you typically won't just have a wind and a battery system. Then you'll have a, di a diesel gen backup because if there's no wind, the battery's going to deplete and it's going to stop. But definitely it will help the cycles. That's the big advantage. So when you look at a little wind turbine, you need to not 100% compare it with solar. You need to actually look at the price of cycling your battery Say, so listen, you know, wind can help me to keep the battery uh, levels higher. But that's a, it's more costly to have wind. Um, I think that's the, that's the short answer. Yes. Penny, uh, you, you just mentioned there now the cost of panels have come down. Could you talk about the history and the at the cost of panels, because I've also seen it in the news that panels have come down because of supply, and just where you think it's going to go. Is it, are they going to go back up, or is this the level right now? Or uh, it's so, so on the big commercial industrial. So what we do is we buy container loads of the stuff. Uh, what we've seen is after COVID, there was a huge spike in transport cost. So that pushed prices up quite dramatically. Then it came down, and now prices have gone up as well. So the short answer is. 
I don't know. The tendency seems to be down, and I think it's pretty much where it's going to be. I can't see major reductions in costs going further. Oh, so typically a 550 watt, um, you, if you buy them in, in, in big volumes, just to give you a, a, a spread, you could pay, I mean, we're paying 260 a watt, like very low, but then it can go up to, well, even less than that, and then it can go up to three, four, five rand. So typically three and a half thousand, between two and a half, three and a half thousand, depends where you are in the cycle. So it's been a very up and down cycle, the, the, the solar panel industry. Uh, you get guys bringing in stock and then it's at the wrong price and literally the next month they sit with the stock and the prices are, are low. So it's supply and demand. But I think typically the levels where we are now is pretty much the good levels. Maybe I can also come in. Last year was a crazy busy year for solar. It was the worst year for our country with regards to the availability of the grid. And we've seen the most load shedding, and we've also seen the most solar or renewable energy installations throughout the country. So it was also our, my most busiest year. I made lots of mistakes and also made lots of money. <laughs> and one of those mistakes was we got so busy that I couldn't cope. We were booked for like three months in advance. And... I was looking for more people to work for me. And so there was a shortage of solar panels. And during that time, it was around March, April, May, there was a shortage and we couldn't get our, our hands on stock. And when stock became available, the prices escalated because the suppliers were basically just milking everyone. And they would say it's because of the rand, dollar, the exchange rate, etc., etc. But that's just baloney. So because of panic, I bought probably about, at the time, 30, 35 pallets of panels, which is over a 1,000 panels. And I, and I got another warehouse just to store the panels because I didn't have enough place to store it. And what we found in July, August, September, the market dipped. And at that time, I was still sitting with plus minus 15, 20 pallets. Now, at that time, I was selling the one solar panel for three and a half thousand and X VAT. When the market came down, more installers came onto the market. The demand slowed down. The levels of load shedding also decreased. And so you saw the scale tipped in favor of the end user or clients, if I can put it to you that way. So that solar panels that I bought for that X amount, the new price that we were getting it for and what I had to sell it for was 2,000 rand. So I was taking a, a thousand and a half thousand and knock on each solar panel during that time. And the, the lesson that I learned from that is you can't plan for the future, especially with regards to ESCOM being involved in your business <laughs> for various reasons. They are a blessing sometimes, <laughs> and they're also a curse and an enemy at another time. I know Kumi is itching to give, me, uh, to give his input, but I also just want to mention that it is almost impossible for, for any to cover everything because solar and renewable is so vast and it is so wide. And I can see that the DC couple side is giving a bit of confusion, but I think it wasn't even necessary, but I think he just wanted to cover everything so that you can have an under understanding. Things that is very important for you as a homeowner or wanting to do solar installation is not only the cost. Because if Henny charges you 100,000 rand and I charge you 100,000 and Kumi charges you 100,000, now what are you going to do now? because now you've got three companies charging you the same amount of money. I will tell you what I learned, and I will give you my experience um, as a business owner. There's lots of hidden things that, that governs South Africa with regards to laws. For example, if you get a company to do solar panels and someone falls off the roof, 
if they don't have the necessary paperwork insurance in place, you as the homeowner will be held responsible. It is your fault. And you will take the punishment and you'll take the blame for that. Okay? So that's one of the things. We had a few installations where one of my guys got a neutral wiring mixed up and just sent wrong voltages through a three-phase system. It damaged almost everything in this camp's house. He, his fridge was 30,000. His coffee machine was 15,000. When, man, it was a long shopping list. And every day something else gets added to the shopping list. And I just see this price keeps going and going and going. I think the price stopped at around 150,000 rand. So now you've got Kumi, and you say, Kumi, you messed up, and here's the bill. And what does Kumi say? I'm just using him for example. And Kumi says, yeah, but things is tough at the moment. Because, you know, work is slow, and I don't even have money to pay the guys. But we'll see when stage six comes back and we're busy, and then I can start paying you off. Or are you going to go with a company that's got the proper insurance in place, public liability, and there's so much more other things involved. So when things like that happens, I don't want my clients to complain. I don't want them to stress. I just tell them, please send me the damage report, and we will do the necessary paperwork. Insurance pays them out, and they are sorted. So it's not so much, there's so much T's and C's, workmanship compensation. If someone gets injured, who's going to pay for them? There's a lot of things that uh, I'll probably remember also when I drive home, I'll, it'll come to my mind that it's not so much. So there's a legal aspect around doing a sole installation, and then it becomes a technical aspect. Your, what you can afford, a Sunsing die, or do you go for the Victron? Um, which I'm very scared of because I struggled for many years to program this Victron, which I eventually just gave up. Victron was very popular along with Goodwe about five, six years ago. Their demand has since dropped because of the price. Sunsink and Dai have basically eaten up the market and they've taken it to them, to themselves. So, yes, Kumi? Okay, it's q and A. I want to answer questions. Okay. I don't, I don't want to talk. <laughs> so, so in an off-grid environment, I was also, like Paul mentioned, sort of, okay, uh, wind turbine would be a good thing to back up because you've got Cape winters where you get a week or two weeks of cold fronts, very little solar production. Um, and, but from what, you sound, what you've said there, it almost sounds like a generator makes more sense, generator and some petrol makes more sense than actually getting a wind turbine? I mean, is, is that where it sits, or...? No, I won't say that. I mean, a generator, a small generator, costs you an arm and a leg mm -hmm. to run per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. So, it, it's, it's a, you, can make, you can make a argument for it, especially if you want it, but you can make an argument. It makes sense. If there's wind, then... Uh, but if you've got solar, then it just makes sense to put more solar panels on. I mean, that's really the simplicity of the argument. Uh, so not run the generator, just put more panels on. Uh, if, there's, if there's enough radiation. Um, if you're sitting in a place where radiation is an issue, you're battling to keep your batteries full, and you, know, you need to put a huge amount of solar panels to make it work, then, uh, then you put up a wind turbine. So that's why I'm saying typically up north, the Netherlands, Ireland, Scotland, typically you'll find these wind turbines littered all over the place. And that's why Denmark looks the way it looks. It's uh, filled with wind turbines. So when the radiation is low, that's really the next best, I would say, source, yeah. Other than biomass, which is very specific to, to what you're busy with doing, yeah. So you spec your solar panels then for winter, not summer? You need to consider that, yeah, because otherwise winter you're going to... Yeah, so you need to look at the worst possible scenario, the dip, and then you design from that up. So uh, just on this question, um, what would your dip be on a, on a cloudy day? What would, uh, I mean, open to the panel, um, what, so you've got a cloudy day, at what percentage are you going to be running? It could be very lower. So, so typically last week on the farm, I mean, we've got about just over 10 kilowatts of panels. 
I mean, we were hardly producing 600 watt, so it can dip significantly. It depends on the, on the overcast. But if you've got overcast, and it, it really, it, what drives it is the radiation. So sometimes we have overcast and we're producing very well. So it's not to say that if there's clouds, you're not going to produce. It really just depends how thick that cloud layer is. But it can push it right down. Sorry, I know there's other questions waiting, but I know my, my son works in it. And he said, he told me that on a really hot day, the, the panels become less efficient mm. as well. So maybe just, if you guys can maybe just sort of how the panels work on efficiency, because I would assume the, the hotter the day, the better the panel would work. But apparently this is not the case. No, it's not. So, so typically in the Northern Cape, when it gets really hot, 40 odd degrees, your panel production goes down. So it is temperature, temperature sensitive. So when you design the system, you always need to look at that in mind as well. So typically if you design for certain radiation and you've got cool weather coming through, but the radiation is, is, is very high, you could get a spike in production and actually damage the system as well. So the guys look at all of those things. Um, they did a study in the Netherlands putting panels up vertically like this. Um, and uh, everybody said, but listen, the angles are wrong, etc." But they did a study, but the cooling effect almost overcame to a big portion the loss of production because of the angle. So, yeah, when you get to 30, 35, 40 degrees, there is a dip. It could be as high. I'm, I might be... Maybe you guys know better than I, but I think it's up to 10 to 15% that you could lose uh, due to temperature. Let me also add on to that. I'll give you an example. At my house, I've got six solar panels, 550 watts each. I've got an 8 kilowatt sun sink inverter, and I've got two 5 kilowatt batteries. I put my whole house through the inverter, so when there's load shedding, the geyser can still work, the oven can still work, but we basically control and I know what's going on. I've switched my main switch off last year, beginning of September. So we are essentially off-grid now with six solar panels. Now you would think that you would need 20 or 30 solar panels to be off-grid, but there's no right there's no perfect calculation to get your solar system calculated correctly. Because if your usage today is different than your usage tomorrow, and the weather today is different than the weather tomorrow. So there's different variables that you need to take into account. Now, people think that you need a lot of solar panels to get off-grid. It's not necessarily, you need a balance. If you've got a lot of solar panels, but nobody is at home during the day, it, once your batteries is full, your solar drops, boom. And it's only going to run. If you have a million panels on your roof, it's only going to be so little, because only your Wi-Fi is on and your electric fencing and your fridge comes on every hour or two when the compressor kicks in. So to size the solar system, you need, it depends, are you at home? Are you forcing your pool pump on? Are you forcing your geyser on? Do you have a geyser timer? Uh, do you have a newborn baby where you're doing laundry every day and your wife bakes cake every afternoon where you can put a lot of, you know, load during the day when the sun is out? And if not, you need maybe less solar panels and more battery storage because you use more power when you get home. Giza comes on, wife starts cooking, you doing this, the children's blow around the hair. So the way you size the system is different from house to house, if that answers. But I cannot also just say you lose X amount of efficiency in a cloudy day because your cloudy day might be different to my cloudy day. It's, it's, there's, no, there's no correct answer, but you do use, lose a lot. I would say it's more than 50% efficiency. So when you are in a residential, you've got the grid as a backup. You can use ESCOM when your battery is low or the weather is not good. You've got, the, but when you're on a farm, and I like what you say, between the sticks, it's a new term I've learned now, <laughs> between the sticks, between the trees also, it's up to you, then you don't have the luxury of ESCOM, because your farm is over there, but the nearest grid connection is over there, and to run cables from there to there, you can buy lots of panels and batteries, so rather control your own investment if that makes sense. So now you don't have the, re the reliability and the, and the benefit of ESCOM, you need to oversize for winter. And your return on investment shoots through the roof 
because it's not actually calculated like that. Now, it's calculated for the benefit of you having a sustainable lifestyle, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, it, it's always interesting when we look at this type of presentations, um, we're just looking mostly at the install and Henny kind of touched on it. So I'm just wondering, Dean and Kumi, in terms of maintenance, what should people plan for? I mean, Henny mentioned, you know, your inverter, they replace inverters every seven years. Um, you know, something like, uh, you know, dust on panels, that type of stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, that's something for me that I always see being overlooked, maintenance of that system. What, what, what are the other things that should be taken into consideration? Because, I mean, that also has either a time or a cost implication. Yes, the new thing now, <clears throat> or the new business that uh, most of the people are doing is solar panel cleaning. Because there's, uh, there's people are cleaning solar panels now. And also the other thing that is also very important, shading. Shading is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is one of your enemies, or is one of the challenges that most of the people are, are experiencing in terms of generating energy. So which means that if you, for instance, in a farm, Sometimes your, sol your solar panels, I mean, the trees will be growing towards the direction of your, of your I mean, towards the, the, your trees might be covering the sun or your trees might block some of the, of, the, of, the, of the solar panels and everything. Therefore, it's very important for you to always make sure that um, uh, you, 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 you trim your trees accordingly in order for them not to block um, the, 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 the sun and also in order for them not to cause shading. Uh, trees, grass, and um, the other thing that is very important as well when it comes to the issue of maintenance of the solar panels is your um, cabling, um, especially the DC cable. Most of the people don't usually look at this, but sometimes the DC cable corrodes. And uh, we, had, we had some problem with one of my clients the other day, we were wondering, why are, the client is here. Why are we having problems with this? Only to find out um, uh, that the DC cable shifted a little bit and he was not generating 100%. He was not getting 100% from, uh, from, uh, from his solar panels. He was getting around about 50%. Um, so what I'm trying to say, and we did just a small thing, uh, reconnecting or reconnecting the cable, then everything went back to normal. What I'm trying to say is that uh, you need to take a look at those things and um, you need to make sure, that, so, uh, in, and when you're installing solar or an inverter, you don't just install and look away or turn away and you don't worry anymore. You need to make sure that you go and check if this thing is giving you what you paid for. Uh, you need to make sure that um, you, you, you are able to see the reading on your phone or on your tablet or, 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 or how, in a, however way that you're checking your stuff in order for you to make sure that everything is running. Most of the people, they think it's plug and play, but we have full responsibility of making sure that everything is in order. The other last thing that I wanted to mention uh, is the issue of compliancy. Um, it's very, very important. Most of the people, um, there are big companies um, that are busy rolling out, uh, renting out solar panels and installing solar panels. Uh, to them, it's more about quantities. Uh, and uh, the other, it's all about quantities. So quality of the work is not that important because everybody wants to do, everybody wants another project, another project. It is very important um, for you to make sure that people, the people that you will be using, they comply, they are accredited. Uh, the PV green card covers your insurance. Most of the insurance, if, you've, if somebody has done the installation for you, but they don't have the PV, they are not PV green card accredited, which means that um, your solar panels or your whole system won't be covered as well. So uh, it is very important for, for, for anyone to look at those things. And also the SENS 10142. Most of the people install solar panels and they don't register them with city of Cape Town. And they tell you, no, we're done now. This thing is working, no more load shedding for you. And you're also happy, no more load shedding. But city will fine you at the end of the day if you don't, if you did not uh, comply with them, and uh, most of the people are sitting with that problem. Problem now, 
They've, they do have installers, but the installers are not accredited and they don't comply with the city of Cape Town. So uh, it is also a small Anyana thing that I wanted to mention, but not only with, uh, yeah, that's another small Anyana thing that I wanted to mention. Um, yes. And just to add on to what Kumi said now, I disagree with him slightly on the PV Green Court. I think that's a very gray area. Um, I think the PV Green Court people themselves don't know what they're actually issuing people, but that's just my take. You're welcome to do your own research. But one thing that I do want to mention is I'll be doing a video on Tuesday with a company called M Solar Power, where I'll be explaining what a certificate of compliance is and who is allowed to sign off. So Kumi and myself both have license to sign off, but he's got a different license. So I've got a single phase tester license and he's got a three phase. Uh, in, uh, he's an installation electrician, which means he can sign off single and three phase. The law changed, I think, in two or three years ago, two, about two years ago, where I'm allowed to sign off single phase. They changed that now that I'm only allowed to sign off single phase in a house with AC but no DC. And what you'll find is a lot of people that have my kind of license are still, are still signing off certificate of compliance. And now what happens when you come to the second phase of the SSEG registration and you're looking for the commissioning approval, they want to take, check who did the COC and they will find out, no, Mr. Dean is not an installation electrician, so the COC is not valid. Or something happens, you need to claim with insurance, they want to see you signed off, no. This is the wrong person that signed off. So that is also something that's very, very important when you're making your, your decision. Uh, guys, uh, could you please talk about uh, selling back uh, to the grid? Just, uh, just the background of all that. I have no idea about, about, about that. So when you export back into the grid, as far as I know, only the city of Cape Town issues a bidirectional meter. And when you see the mayor, Gordon Hill Lewis, giving presentations and talks on TV, you can get e-wallet e and e-bucks and e this and e that, there's T's and C's that apply, okay? So for example, I'd, I'd, I'd done my own calculation. It's, it's now with the increase this month, three rand eight cents. For the first 600 kilowatt hours, you pay three rand eight cents for one unit, okay? If you export back into the grid, you get paid, I think it's one rand seven cents or one rand 25 cents, if I'm not mistaken. So when you export one unit back, let's just say it's one rand for now. You export that one rand back, you are credited one rand. So at night when your battery is depleted and you use that same kilowatt hour back, you pay the difference. So the three rand eight cents minus the one rand, it's two rand eight cents. So you still, it's not like one, one for one or like for like. For like. That's the first catch. Second catch, it's about 10,800 rand for a bidirectional meter. You pay the municipality, they install it, and then, then, and then there's a monthly fee, I think, AMI meter fee, which is about 91 rand or 89 rand thereabout. So that's another thing you need to take into account. And then the third thing is, you can only export a maximum of 25% of your main breaker size. So if your main breaker is 60 amps, you can only export a maximum of 15 amps for the most. Let's just say 15 amps is 5 kilowatts. Even though you have a huge solar array that is doing 15 kilowatts and you've got nothing else to use the power on, you can only export a certain portion. So you're throttled. So when you're thinking, you know what, are you going to retire? Huge solar system, your roof is full, you're building a carport, your whole house looks like a solar panel show and you're going to make money. It doesn't work that way. The city has a way to ensure that they will win, <laughs> not you. The short answer is don't calculate that into your decision making. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is one question, please. Um, so, so I see these people put up the, uh, when you build a new roof, they put beautiful tiled, um, roofs up, and then they cover it with these um, solar panels. So I want to know if one thinks of a new roof, 
a new Inica is going to put a lot of solar panels on it. Is there nowadays a product that, that it is your roof or it is your final um, covering? It feels like a, a bit of a double thing if, if you're going to put a roof down and, uh, and going to cover it with these panels. Yeah, I know Tesla has got those tiles, but I mean, we've got no experience in that. We don't deal in that market, but it makes sense. I mean, uh, a solar panel, uh, we're looking at the farm to, to the, the shed for our tractor and stuff to, to actually make that the roof. Uh, there's no reason why not. It, it, it gives you a little bit of sun, but I'm not sure. I, I think Tesla has got this solar tile. I'm not sure if they're selling it here locally, etc. But yeah, you're right. They're putting up expensive Italian tiles and chup, cover them, <laughs> them with solar panels. Um, but you can certainly yeah, seal the panels and make a roof of it. But this is now for us on the farm. I'm not sure if the local municipality bylaws and stuff, I think that, that's, a whole, that's a whole discussion on its own. So m maybe you can comment on if you are putting a new roof on, as an installer, what would you recommend as the best roof to install solar on for, for your ease and uh, financially, et cetera? That's a very good question because there's lots of different roofs, tile, IBR, corrugated, clip block, and we, the worst roof is a, is a uh, cement flat roof because you can't drill into that roof. So then you have to use A-frames and use ballast blocks. And then you'll see what we had two weeks ago where we had panels and blocks flying off a three-story building in Camps Bay. So that is the nightmare. But if you're building a house from scratch and you need to decide, obviously there's cost that needs to be taken into account. And I think the corrugated metal sheets is the, the cheapest and then it's the IBR and then it's the tiled. What I like about the tiles is that you slide them up, you put the hook into the beam, and then you slide the towel down again. When it comes to hanger bolts for your, IB, your corrugated iron, you drill right through the sheet. It comes with rubber grommets, and you can use uh, sickle flex to seal it, but you always might have the possibility of leaks coming in. I think... the. the the best roof, if I had to choose myself, would be clip lock, because clip lock clips on the outside, and you don't have any drilling to do. The cons to that is the wind, if it's very strong, you can just rip it apart. If it is something else, I would choose the IBR, because IBR goes over and you drill on the side, small screws, and that seems to be quite tight, because remember, your, your water goes in between the channels and not on the on the lip of the ridge of the IBR. I hope that answers maybe the guys have something else. Yeah, Kumi, maybe you want to comment your experience as well. No, 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 I fully agree with him, the IBR. Um, but also, most of the people are having a um, tile roof. You know, um, that also works very well. But um, one of, um, we went to go and inspect one of the houses now, our brother is here from church. Um, they did exactly what he did, putting on, uh, just putting on a clipping without drilling. Uh, you must make sure that the guys and, uh, and, 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 and um, Tinashe's uh, roof, uh, all the panels went, around about eight panels flew, and all those panels were broken this, just, just this weekend. And uh, when we inspected the, everything, the roof hooks, everything, but we were wondering, how can the roof hooks but uh, it's just opening the tile and also putting it there. So you must make sure that people do proper job. They drill into these things um, just to make sure that everything is, 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 is secured. But the worst tile that, or the worst roof that I've worked with is a slate roof. You don't want to work with that kind of roof. <laughs> he agrees with me as well. So that's, 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 that's the worst one um, because with that one, it's, it's more sensitive. I've never seen a roof like that, but you don't want to work with that kind of thing. So it, 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 for me, um, from IBR, uh, uh, tile, and uh, if you've got those two, at least you can work with those. I mean, if you want to buy a roof, if you can't have uh, IBR, at least settle for a tile. It's much better. Um, yeah, I was just wondering. I, I saw Solar Edge in Henny's presentation. I was just wondering, 
um, microinverter installs. Um, do you have them? How popular are they? Why aren't they more popular? Because it just seems like it's it's a little bit more scalable, uh, you know, from an uh, uh, in installation, you know, for future expansion. Meaning they they they're more expensive. So the, usually you need to look at the at the economics behind it. So you'll typically use them where there's a lot of panel groups, let's say bigger installations where they face different directions. Um, then it makes sense because then it doesn't limit that set. So, uh, you know, if there's shading and things like that. So it's more commercial residential blocks. So there's a specific area that you, you would use them. Um, I know they're very good inverters, very good systems. Um, I know that our guys sometimes use them, but then it's determined by typically those factors. So they are more expensive. I think that's the biggest reason why they're not used everywhere. And Dean and, and Kumi, do you guys install that or, or not? It's funny because I have an engineer that uh, keeps discussing this with me and I've been ignoring him for a long time. Um, and it keeps popping up and he wants to team up with me and look into microgrids, so <laughs> maybe. But to answer your question, why does people not know? Because the word of mouth is just not caught fire yet. So there was a time when nobody knew about solar. Then it was like, how can you not know about solar? Now everybody knows about solar, you know? So I think it will be the same. I have limited understanding with, uh, with microgrids and I think probably just because we keep going with the flow, and until the flow becomes saturated or dry, then people will look at alternative ways, and then it will start to to broaden out, I think. And another thing, people are buying, um, I've never installed Solar Edge, but um, the, the support system of the current, um, uh, like SunSync and inverters, I mean, and uh, they, they do have 24 hour support system wherever and the, it's, 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 it's smooth. The likes of Victron, you have Victron accredited um, uh, 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 um, wholesalers, uh, accredited stores, they will give you the support. But I think Solar Edge is a matter of maybe, um, uh, uh, they, it's not well marketed. They are not, the brand is not well marketed here in South Africa. And as well, um, I'm not sure, maybe I'm wrong, but in terms of the support, I haven't seen that much because I think people, you know, word of mouth, as you have mentioned before, people, if you tell me that something is good, I've never tried other systems, but I would go with what you're saying is good, you know? So I think that's... I think also I need to remember that Solar Edge is a grid tide inverter. Yes. And grid tide, I, I want to just also explain, some, touch on something that Annie mentioned about grid tide inverters and hybrid inverters. There's a distinct difference between the two. A grid tied inverter just has solar panels connected to the inverter, and then you've got your AC cables, your copper cables going into your main distribution board. That's it. Solar, no matter how much panels you have, let's say it's producing one kilowatt, and your business is using two kilowatts, you just use the, the, the extra one kilowatt from the grid. The purpose of grid tied inverters is more for commercial. Mm. So for example, where people are operating most of the time when the sun is out. Let's just use ShopRite for example. Now ShopRite works from eight o'clock till five o'clock. Now they, their electricity bill is 100, 150,000 rand for the month. So they want what is the cheapest inverter. It's a grid tied inverter. Mm. So the same price for for example, an 8 kilowatt hybrid inverter, you can get uh, maybe, let's say, 30, 40 kilowatt grid tide inverter. Huge difference. You can have a huge solar array for a fraction of the price. So that is a grid tide inverter. The main purpose of a grid tide inverter is reduce electricity bill. Now, why you don't find that in, in, in residential homes? Because we want to kill two birds with one stone. Now, solar edge or Fronius, which are very popular linked with uh, Victron. They were quite popular a few years ago until SunSync and Dai came into the market and they really have taken a chunk. So what SunSync and Dai have done with the hybrid inverter is that they said we're going to kill two birds with one stone and, they, and, and they've come up with a very affordable system where it's grid-tied and it's off-grid all in one. 
So when you have solar panels connected to an inverter, it will then supplement your entire property. Even if your geyser comes on or your oven comes on, the solar panels is going to give power to your entire property. However, when the grid falls away, the grid tied part of the inverter falls away, then the backup part of the inverter kicks in, which is your battery. The nice thing about this inverter is that your solar panel still works even when it's load shedding or the grid collapses. Your solar panels will then only supply power to your critical loads, which most of the time is your lights and your plugs. And if the solar is not enough, your battery will give the power. So that is essentially the difference between a grid tide and a hybrid inverter. So the reason why you don't hear much about solar edge and Fronius, for one, the price, and number two, the application. Just a quick example, just a quick one. For instance, our, our, our college here, Helderberg College, they're having a grid tide inverter. Most of the people see a lot of solar panels on top of our roof here. They wonder, why are we having load shedding? Or why are we having generator? But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a grid tide inverter, meaning that when there's load shedding, they will experience load shedding because they, there's no, they, all that energy, they don't store energy anywhere. So um, I'm just making just a typical example of, of, the, of, of what is currently going on and something that is close to us or something that we can relate to. Yeah, one thing. So, so Ram, it's, it's horses for courses. It depends on the design. So solar edge is very popular, but in commercial and industrial space. So the reason for that is the efficiency is very high on grid tight inverters to convert DC to AC, and that's where the AC coupled systems come in. They're not used that much in residential segment because on the commercial industrial side, the guys really need to optimize because it's so competitive. So every single kilowatt in terms of the return makes sense. So, um, but yeah, it's two different type of things. The, the, it's, it's two different technologies, two different applications, yeah. Yeah, Kumi, uh, you mentioned that you are three-phase in, in, installer. So just tell us a, very briefly the difference between a single phase and a three stage, a three phase, because I know we're gonna, we need to go three phase on our farm. So maybe just give us a little bit. And then after you've spoken to that, Henny, you can maybe think on this question, alternative storage, like a water storage running through a hydro, um, also high pressure uh, and air pressure storage. Are there other alternatives to battery? If you could maybe just touch on that. Yeah, uh, Kumi. Yes, um, the difference is not that much. Is that the difference between the two? Um, one, um, you must write, okay, with a, with a, with a three-phase installer, you must write your, okay, let me not go deep into the, <laughs> what you need to write and all that stuff. The three-phase installer can sign off single-phase and three-phase, meaning that um, w with, with a single-phase installer, you can only sign domestic, which is single-phase, 210 and uh, and uh, and uh, and 30 um, volt installations. If you are three, if you are a, a three phase or um, uh, a, a, I mean a, 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 a three phase installer, you can sign off commercial spaces, domestic, and also um, uh, small holdings like a farm and all that stuff. As long as it is three phase, anything that is three phase. Um, what is the difference between three phase and single phase? Maybe I need to explain that a single phase is what you are using in your houses, the domestic electricity, most of the time in, 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 in every, in, in normal houses, they are using 220, 240 volts. And um, in some of these commercial spaces, or maybe some of the houses, even here in, um, in Elderbeck, there are houses that are three phase, meaning that these houses have uh, life one, life two, life three, and neutral incoming. Whereas with the single phase, it's, live and neutral. Those, those are two different things. And um, yes, that's, 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 that's just me explaining it now within, I hope that I've covered that. Just wanna add something small to that. You get a qualified person, qualified electrician, which we both are single and three phase, mm -hmm. but we are talking about the guy that can sign off the COC. So anybody can do the work single and three phase we're only talking about the certificate of compliance. Once any work is done on your property, you need a certificate of compliance. If you don't have that, if you just add a plug 
and you don't have a COC, then if anything happens, the owner takes responsibility for that. So that's basically what uh, is saying the difference. Henny, if you want to maybe just speak to the, alt if there's alternative storage other than batteries. <laughs> that, that's quite a vast question. <laughs> yeah, so, so, I mean, when you look at residential lithium, that, that's, the, the, that's the cheapest way of, of doing it. Um, I mean, utility scale, there's sand batteries um, that the guys are using. So basically, they're storing heat. So they're storing the heat, and it's remarkably effective. There's uh, concrete batteries where they, uh, essentially, they, they store heat. Um, so, so, so the big difference is, on the one side, you've got generation, and you need to use it, and you've got a little bit of battery capacity. Yeah? So you, in essence, have an intermittent supply. So you need to size your batteries to cover the load. But there's another way of doing solar where you've got base load. So that's typically, if you go to Uppington, you'll see the concentrated solar, that very bright light. I don't know if you've seen it when you go into Uppington, where they concentrate the mirrors to the collector. So that's a molten salt system. So the energy is, is, is stored in molten salt. And by a chemical reaction, they can extract the energy. So you get molten salt batteries. Oh, there's, there's, but I mean, those are all big utility scale type of things. I mean, on a farm, if you've got a, a dam up high, almost like Solaris Pass, the storage pump scheme, you could, you could pump water up, and then you could generate running down. Um, but that's very specific to your property. So almost the closest one, I would think, other than lithium, would be water, if you've got that, that uh, height difference. Um, the, other, the other technologies is a little bit exotic at this stage, I would say. Um, I mean, even lead acid batteries are not even something. The, the lithium has become so cheap, and the trouble you have with those things are so immense that I think I'm not aware of anything in this space that competes with lithium at this stage. Um, yeah. While we're on the, the battery topic, something just popped into my mind, which uh, Henny mentioned earlier. When you mentioned your warranty, and sometimes the battery manufacturer says you have 6,000 cycles. He's mentioned it goes from 100 to 20, and up to 100 there's maybe one cycle, okay? Then you'll find the, the, the manufacturer will say, you must choose our battery because it comes with a 10-year warranty. Now, a lot of people don't read the warranty. And a lot of these batteries are 1C battery, meaning that if it's a 10 kilowatt battery, you can pull 10 kilowatt hours through that. And in the long run, it's detriment to the battery. You are not supposed to pull at least more than half of its capacity. For short bursts, it's fine. Now, the nice thing about a lithium battery is that it comes with BMS, the battery management system, is basically like a motherboard or computer. So now, two years later, something's wrong with the battery. You take it to the manufacturer, they can draw the history. These very good batteries, I think Freedom One is one, but I know Solar MD, they come with like separate loggers, I think it's built in now. They can check the history of your battery remotely. And you pay a bit more for that, but they can balance your cells. It's very intricate and very cool. But a lot of these battery manufacturers are offering 10-year warranties, and none of them have been here for more than 10 years. I don't even think Freedom One has been around for 10 years, but yet they're offering 10-year warranties. So be very careful. I don't want to mention names, but there are some batteries, they say 10 years, but after five years, like, you know, Hyundai, they offer you seven-year, 200,000-kilometer warranty, but after five years, they don't cover your engine in your gearbox. When you, when you look, your only, only your light bulbs is covered under year, year six and year seven of your warranty. So you must read the, the T's and C's. Yeah, maybe to add to that, what's important, it's, X amount of cycles or 10 years, whichever one comes yes. first. So you might run out of cycles and then the warranty is gone in any event. So that's why I mentioned yeah, you need to look after the battery properly, otherwise the warranty is void. There's, there's T's and C's in that warranty and, and you need to read that and understand that. Yeah. Oh, sorry, okay. just quickly, I just remember we're actually involved in a project where there is another battery technology it's what they call vanadium redox. I don't know if you've heard about that. So South Africa is, I think, the third largest producer of vanadium. 
the Vanadium Bushveld Mining Complex. So they've invested in battery technology. So in essence, what it is, Vanadium Redox Electrolyte. So it's super simple. Uh, you've got, you can literally take 2,000 litre tanks, and then what you do is, if you pump through a activator in one direction, you can add electrons, so it's charged, and if you pump in the other direction, you can actually extract. Only problem is they're quite big. So a uh, two megawatt hour battery, um, let's say one megawatt hour battery for lithium would be a 30 foot container, uh, sorry, a 20 foot container, but uh, vanadium redox is three 40 foot containers. So it's much, much bigger. But it's, uh, it's got a theoretical unlimited life. And you can discharge 100% and you can, you can, I think you can double charge it without any damage. The efficiency just goes down. So we've had one project where we're looking at that technology, but it's very um, specific. So it's, 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 uh, there's a company called Cellcube in Austria um, they're partly owned by the South African Vanadium Mining Group. Uh, they're very successful in running it, but it's, it's more for property developers, you, where we're telling the guys, listen, when you build a property and you've got a 25, 30, 40 year lifespan, build that into your property because the, the, the battery can actually last that long. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different mindset, um, uh, but, but that's a technology that's, I would say, closest. There's a crowd in... Um, Australia, that also produces something similar. I think it's red, can't remember. And Mossel Bay Municipality is actually running on those batteries, which is also what they call it's a flow battery. So it's a liquid battery where you pump in different directions. They're very robust, but they also, they're expensive. Um, you know, if you look at a 10 year life in terms of economic sense, it doesn't make sense. It's about 30, 40% more expensive than lithium. But if you look at the life cycle of 20, 25 years, it wins lithium hands down. But it's big, it's big, big type of, uh, you know, it's bulky. Like a 40, 40 kilowatt hour battery would typically be as big as a double Coke fridge that you get in the shops. So that's typically the size of it. But uh, for Nierkpan, where they do the land speed records, that whole site runs on a vanadium redox battery, a cell Q battery, a 40 kilowatt hour one. Okay, so, um, yeah, that's very interesting because on a country property, you've, space is obviously not an issue. Mm. Um, so is it, is it currently viable to actually look at that as a, yeah, can you that, actually do it on that small scale? It's, it's, it's more expensive, but it depends on your view. If you've got a 20, 25 year view, most people would say, oh, technology is so rapidly changing. What's gonna be here in 10, 15 years? I'm not gonna take that investment risk. But if you look at it, and, and this is the nice thing, 60% of the vanadium battery cost is actually the electrolyte, and you can sell the electrolyte after the life of the battery. So technically, you could get 60% of the electrolyte back, or, or the battery cost back, if there was a market for that. But um, the guys opened up an electrolyte factory in East London. So it's a technology, it's not a new technology, it was the first technology that was used in the space program. It was vanadium redox. So it's not, a, it's not an exotic technology. It's just the, the energy prices in the market started to make sense now for those type of batteries. But yeah, you could. Um, as I said, there's, there's, oh, there's, a, there's a, the factory in Joburg also running off one of those batteries, and then for Nierpan. And we're actually looking at getting into that technology, manufacturing it locally under license. Um, but it's horses for courses. It's not gonna fit everybody. It's definitely not for residential. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I get back to this uh, three phase, one phase? I, I have a, a three phase and, and one phase. I've got uh, three um, inverters, five kilowatt inverters. So I run a boral pump, three phase boral pump because it's more economical to go three phase if you go deep or if you, and also a chipper three phase. But, but I'm limited to five kilowatt per uh, inverter. And, and I did not take that into consideration when, I, when, when we calculated. Uh, the contractor came and he asked me how, how much do I use per month. I said about 1,500 uh, kilowatt per month. But he did not check what my peak usage is at any one specific time. And now I'm limited to 
to five kilowatt at any specific time. And that is a drawback. That's something that uh, uh, one needs to on the batteries it, it with some experience now it makes sense to me to rather go for more batteries than more solar because I have surplus solar during the day and I run out of battery sometimes when when the uh, cloudy weather or uh, more usage so it seems to me that it makes sense for me to add more batteries rather than more uh, panels. But my question on those batteries is, uh, I, I, I'm of, aware of, uh, I have a 10-year warranty on the battery, but now I hear about cycles. So the cycles may be the limitation in the end of the day because I use, I, I run the batteries up and down quite a bit, almost on a daily basis. Um, should I go for, for more batteries? And what is the, the resale value of that battery once, once I cannot use it anymore? Can I, can I replenish? Can you regenerate the battery, uh, get it back to life? Or what, what is on, on these lithium ion batteries? What, what I would suggest is that maybe um, before selling the batteries, you can try and resell the inverter while you still have time. Because the five kilowatt inverter and the borehole pump, there's a spike that will take maybe around about five o'clock when the sun is, is setting or around about six o'clock, depending on where you, you are. Uh, when that spike comes in, then it will be difficult. It will even trip sometimes your, I'm sure that sometimes it does trip your inverter. You would find out that you can't flush your, I, you can't flush your bathroom and dry your hair at the same time, you know, um, but you need to look at those things. So what I would suggest is that um, if there's a way, try to resell your inverter so that you can get a bigger inverter in order for you to be able to mm. cater for, for, your, for, your, for, your, for, your, for your needs. That's, that's what I would suggest. Yes. Yeah, there's maybe another option. Uh, I don't know what inverters you've got. You can, you can add more inverters, so you could, yeah, so you should be able to, I mean, you've got three, you should be able to parallel, two, 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 then you've got six. Um, but I don't, I don't know. That's, I know that with the Victrons you can do that. You can. I, this sounds to me like this guy probably, whoever did installation did it more than three or four years ago. Yeah. Two years. Uh, two years. Because there is a three-phase sun sink inverter, which is a 12 kilowatt. And I think the reason why he never chose that inverter is because he maybe assumed that the 12 kilowatt is going to be insufficient. So you basically have four kilowatts per phase. So even though one phase can go up to six, and then the other two is throttled three and three. But I'm not too sure why they have done this three single phase and your three phase installation. So you can't add you can, but you're going to be spending quite a bit of money. And now your system is going to be oversized. And your return on investment now moves so far to the right that it becomes about convenience other than money and your investment. So I think it's a, it's a very difficult one because there is only one current three-phase hybrid inverter, which is a sun sink and die, which is the 12 kilowatt. So your, your option is either to sell that three and you're probably going to get 50% for the price and then you're going to have to take two 12 kilowatts and it's going to be a 24, so you're going to have eight kilowatts per phase. But, uh, it's well, like Yeni says, horses for courses. It depends how much money you want to invest and how much money you want to save. So if you have got two batteries and your electricity bill is still um, 500 rand, now let's say you add another battery, so you spend 25,000 rand, but your, your, your bill drops 200 rand per month. So how long is that 200 rand going to calculate into 25,000 rand? 
The only reason you're going to want to add an additional battery is if we go to stage 10. And 100% of your two batteries is not enough to cover you for six hours. Then I will suggest maybe look into adding an additional battery. But it, it goes from house to house. It just depends how much you want to invest in. You can add more batteries. Uh, but the thing is, it's your cells have now already been used of your, for your two or three years now. Now you're adding new batteries. You're going to parallel them together. Hopefully it's paralleled properly. I don't even know how is it how is it connected. What batteries do you have? SA something. It's SA. I can't remember now. What color is it? Black. It's an it's a, um, solar MD. Is it not solar MD with a yellow X on it? Something SA. I don't know. It's just one battery. Three. Three, three, five kilowatts. Well, maybe you can discuss this afterwards. You can, mm. you can have a chat with him afterwards. Mm. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention, I know, Luke, when we were looking at our solar usage, uh, our energy usage, you can get those little meters or something you click mm. on and they can leave it for a week. Just t tell us a little bit about it quickly, someone. Yeah, so... Just before D, yeah, so typically on the, uh, I would say all installations, they need to run um, your usage so that you've got a clear, it, it sounds like this guy maybe didn't measure, but it's good to run the usage so that you can see typically what happens. Residential are usually the same, but when you get to commercial and industrial, you always do it. And in fact, we, we measure the peaks, we measure them five millisecond peaks because that can, can change the whole system design. Because that, typically, you might have averages, and averages are quite dangerous, because you might have averages of 250 kilowatts running through the system, but it's peaking at 350, where motors and things are starting up, et cetera, et cetera. So there was one client, wasn't our client, he installed a system, it was quite a few million rand. He had to spend two million rand just on getting VSDs and his internal grid sorted out, because the system wouldn't run. So typically, I would say let them measure, measure the peaks if that's the way you're going to run. And then you need to be very cautious when you go forward and install extra systems on your internal grid. A microgrid is a very sensitive, unforgiving little thing. You know, if you do funny stuff, it just trips. Um, so typically on a farm, it's maybe not that bad, but if you've got a process site running with a, with a factory and things like that, you don't want those type of things to happen. So. I would say it's always good, even for residential, just go and measure. Um, you don't need to measure that long. Maybe a week is fine. A few days is even fine, just to see what the cycles are. Um, OK. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we need what, to wrap up. Question? Are there any more Measuring. pressing questions? OK, I, I wonder, Kumi, if we want to in one minute, your last advice, someone's going to install uh, Dean and then Henny. Just quickly wrap it up, and then Henny, you can close, maybe close with a word of prayer for okay. us as well. Thanks. Double check. Um, make sure that you've got the right installer. Make sure, be there. We, uh, don't allow somebody to do the work and you uh, it's, 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 it's very important that when one is busy at your house or busy with an installation, for you to make sure that you are there, you're present, you, are, you, you, you are there to manage or you are there to see that it does things correct. Because there are a lot of people who take shortcuts in this field of ours. And um, the other thing, it is very important that you comply to the municipality. I've seen a lot of people being penalized, a lot of money. Make sure that you comply to the municipality. That's all that I can say from my side. I think I would say what I mentioned earlier about doing your checks on the company. Do they have the necessary, do they have the necessary paperwork? And do they have stability? Do they have finances? If something goes wrong, are they able to, to cover for, for what mistakes or problems might have occurred? Yeah, that's what I have to say. Yeah, so my, maybe my last comment's a little bit weaving away from solar. 
the reason why we're having this discussion is because our infrastructure is failing. If ESCOM didn't fail, we wouldn't have had this, this conversation. Solar would have been in its place for specific applications. There is an economic argument for certain solar, but I think coming back to country living and those things, it should be a wake-up call for all of us because it's not the only system that's currently failing. Our electricity system is failing and a blackout is not impossible. We've gone through a blackout in Lady Smith for two weeks. It's, it's hectic. Eh? Mm. You pretty much lose everything that's in your fridge. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something to go through. If you haven't gone through something, like that, it was quite detrimental. So, so that infrastructure is busy failing. I mean, you, you're not going to fix ESCOM in, in, in a few months unless, yeah, those assets take a long time to build. And it's not the only infrastructure that's failing. Our water infrastructure is failing. They're talking about water shedding in Gauteng. Uh, so, so, and, and water and electricity runs together. So it's one thing to have solar in your home when there's a blackout, but remember, sewage is going to stop and water supply is going to stop. So you might have lights, but you're going to have a lot of other stuff. So it just weaves back into country living. Each one just needs to assess how do you build some resilience into your family and your lifestyle and in your, even into your business. I mean, there's one thing we haven't even discussed and that's ESG auditing. So it's environmental and social governments. It's, it's been pushed out to 2025, but that's gonna wipe out a lot of small businesses in South Africa because the um, compliance is just gonna be so heavy in terms of your energy usage, what type of energy you're using, carbon credit, you know, all these things and it's a whole new economy forming and it's not conducive for building and supporting small businesses. So um, that's my closing, closing thoughts. As families, uh, think about these things. You know, this, what we're facing in South Africa is not contained in South Africa. Huh? You're seeing it in Australia, they've had load shedding. You're seeing it in Germany, UK, America. So it's almost like a theme in the times that we're living in. Infrastructure are under pressure build some resilience into your life. I want to just add on to something. I don't want it to be the last mm. comment, but I just, I just want to give you, from my understanding, what's currently happening. None of us know the real intricacies of what's going on with our power supply. There's lots of talk about corruption. There's lots of talk about money being involved, politics being involved. We don't know the absolute truth. Only God knows but we are only doing what we're doing as a result of the reality, okay? The reality is that ESCOM are billions and billions and billions of rands in debt, and they need us to buy electricity from them so that they can be sustainable, but they are not sustainable. So by giving load shedding, they are solving one problem because the grid cannot sustain the, the country. But at the same time, the more load shedding there is, the less electricity we are using. So it's a catch-22. So what's happening now is they are every time increasing, 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 because they need to get a certain amount, and they know that there's load shedding. So the only way that they're going to get their target is to increase. So what people are doing now is a lot of people are doing solar, and less and less and less people are being able to use of the grid. And it's putting ESCOM in a very difficult corner. And they've put themselves in that corner. So this is the current situation that we are facing. Now, I don't know why there's no load shedding now. There's talks of... Maybe there's, it's got to do with the election. We you don't see, know. <laughs> Henny fell into that. I didn't want to say that, but Henny fell into that. Thanks for saying it. But, or Rugby World Cup. <laughs> But uh, that's, my, that's my thoughts as well. I, there's elections coming, and I just find it to be so ironic that the, the clouds are starting to, to, to gather, and the sun is not producing as, as much yield, and the demand is going up because winter is now approaching, but now all of a sudden there's no load shedding. So there's lots of things happening behind the scenes. I just want to say, I'm not saying you must buy solar, but if you want to buy solar, now is the time. The price of inverters and batteries and solar panels are at an all-time low. So if you can get that and you're, and you're right install at the right price, now is the perfect time because you don't know what's going to happen, for example, after elections. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think 
we're very privileged. Uh, I know we say the cost of living is, but these things are cheaper than they've ever been. Um, and, I, and I think Enya really appreciate your closing comments as well. I think as we look at, uh, everything's falling apart and we need to start taking these things serious because it's gonna be quicker on us than what, what we expect. Um, so the next one we'll be having on the, I think it's the 19th of May, and that will be about buying a property, the legal implications, how to do it, the options you have of buying. We'll be having a chartered accountant as well who will be telling us about the entities you can buy in a trust, a private person, corporation, company, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is very important and can be uh, detrimental lifelong if you, if you put it into the wrong entity. So please join us then. And I just want to thank Henny very much <laughs> for your wonderful presentation. Learned a lot. And Dean and Kumi, we thank you for your professional time. And Henny, if you would close in a word of prayer for us. Thank okay. you. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for yeah, the ability to have discussions and uh, be open-minded about our challenges. And we know that we can make plans all we want. If you don't bless them, it's going to be in vain. So we want to pray that you'll guide in each, every one of us, that we will hear your Holy Spirit's voice so that we can make decisions for our families and prepare for your kingdom that's soon to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And on a closing note, this is recorded. It will be on the Silver Leaf uh, website. So you... I know I'll go back and have a look so you can recap because a lot of the information is technical. So it is available there. You can just go down there and watch it on YouTube. Thank you very much. May God bless.